kind of have not be relatives. Maybe you are to his scope. You huh? Welcome back to Iconic American Indian, the podcast. I am your host, Opie Miha. Hope everyone is doing well on this Friday. Uh, peace to everybody who um, is out there in the chat. Um, so before we get started, uh, I'm going to let some people get a chance to come in here. Um, Orlando Williams, peace, brother. Good to see you. Um, Sister uh, Cherokee Tulu, peace, sis. Good to see you as well. And uh, let me get some music going here, and we'll let some people uh, get into the live stream. So give me just a second here. All right. So we're going to rock out for a minute. Let me uh, get some volume on this music here. Now, again, I hope y'all doing well. Peace to everybody. But we're going to let some people get into the uh, live stream uh, again. Kind of an impromptu live stream. Didn't really have it planned out. Um, wanted to finish up with uh, what we were covering last time. Um, again, that's a long read. I had to skip some portions of it. So we're going to get back to it. Hey, Bree. Good to see you, sis. Glad you're back. Good to see you. So, yeah, we're going to let the music rock out for a little bit. But peace to everybody for being here. I appreciate y'all. Oh, yeah. Also, too, while we're waiting for people to come in, um, if you haven't had a chance to get over to the Mixcloud page, uh, please do so. Um, this is what it looks like. So got some people over here. My bad, Marquise. If you can't hear any sound on here, um, I think I have it muted because it's like playing double. Um but once I start getting into the uh, stream itself, uh, maybe I can unmute it. Let me check something real quick here. But once I start getting it. Yeah. So what's good, Ra? So my bad, brothers, if it's uh, if you don't hear any sound coming in on this side, um, just jump over to the YouTube page. Oh, you can hear me. OK. OK, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, I had to turn it. I got to turn the volume down because it, it plays double on my ear if I don't. I right, see who we got in here. Uh, Miss Shea Pink. Peace. Good to see you, sis. What's good, Monte? Um, we got Big Dog Philly. Peace to you. My brother Wanagi. Uh, yeah, and Petta Waste, my brother. Uh, Macadon One. Peace to you. So again, y'all, um, I put a link at the top. Uh, we got a group that we do over on uh, Clubhouse and uh, something that we're actually doing uh, solution wise. It's called the Atonchinist Party. Um, the link is, the link should be pinned. Um, you know, come on over, check us out, see what we're doing. Um, if you are on Clubhouse, look for myself, uh, Wanagi, uh, Shay. Shay Pink, Embry Ocha. Uh, look for any of us over there. You know, we're over there trying to build to, uh, you know, get some real life solutions going. Um, you know, making some great strides in that, in that regard. So if you want to know more, if you want to be a part of it, uh, please definitely get over to the Autonomous Party. I might have said that wrong in the beginning. Sorry. The Autonomous Party. And also, um, like I was saying before, I'm over on Mixed Cloud, so get on over here and, uh, you know, subscribe as well. Would like to move the content mainly over to this page. Um, so, again, you can find me on Mixed Cloud. Uh, just search OP Miha. All right, y'all. Again, I hope everyone is doing well. 
So today we are going to uh, get back into um, the free African American um, introductory page. So the reason why I want to do that is because it has a ton of uh, info. What's good, Adrian Tan? Good to see you. So it's got a ton of information um, that uh, kind of explains things, and there's some gems in there as well. Um, before we get started, of course, you know, I'm always going to do my disclaimer. Dodge the hijack. Um, you're going to hear the word African-American a lot in this. Um, you know, we know that word wasn't being used back in the day. So, you know, just for your understanding, just please uh, understand and understand what I'm reading to you. Um, I think at this point we all, you know, can do that. So. All right, y'all. So let's get into this, because like I said, this is a lot of reading. Um, so, yeah, let's hit it. So last time we were here, I kind of left off here and then I skipped down to the uh, Indian portion and we will finish up the Indian portion today as well. All right. So the section we're on now is called the discriminatory taxation. And I'm going to read this and then we'll kind of discuss. So it says um, they suffered under the, the discriminatory North Carolina tax law enacted in 1723 and reinstated in 1749, which described taxables as all and every white person, male of the age of 16 years and upwards, all Negroes, mulattoes, musties, male or female, and all persons of mixed blood to the fourth generation of the age of 12, uh, excuse me, 12 years and upwards, and all white persons intermarrying with any negro mulatto or musty or other person of mixed blood shall be deemed taxables so again this information um in these brackets here says clark clark state records of north carolina and these are the volumes that you can actually find this information on if you're uh, curious or want to do more study all right so again musty um as another one of these uh, words that they were calling, uh, you know, people with Indian descent. All right. So it says thus, free African Americans and Indian households can be identified by the taxation of their female family members. Over 12 years of age, some light skinned people would claim to be white to avoid this discriminatory tax. And they would be listed by the tax collector with the notation refuses to list his wife okay so let's see what it says here in these brackets uh thomas and michael Gowen in the 1761 list of john pope and then it says cr 44.701.19 okay it says it was the interest of the tax collector to classify those of doubtful ancestry as mulatto since he received a portion of the tax. However, those who have some political and economic influence like the Bass and Bunch families were often listed as white. Okay, so we know that um, there's people out there that actually have these surnames, uh, the Bass and the Bunch, and uh, you know, they, they don't look like we would think of, of as white. So just wanted to make that clear. So now we're going to talk about indentured apprenticeships. So we've gone through um, a lot of the family histories where we see this word apprenticeship pop up a lot, or we hear that they were being uh, bond out, which is kind of the same thing. So as we know, with an apprenticeship, um, you know, you're learning a skill or trade under someone else and they would be uh, the master of that trade. So to me, that's kind of where we where I'm kind of putting together that that's maybe where uh, the slave master thing is coming from. All right, let me jump to the chat real quick. See what's going on. 
Gun smoke. What's good, my brother? Been a while. Peace. Miss Tanari. Much honors to you, sis. Thank you for being here. All right, y'all. So it says, in addition to the discriminatory tax, poor and orphaned African-American children. So again, like I told y'all, Dodge, she's hijacked. So I don't want to say it a million times like I did last live, but y'all know the Dodge that word. You know, these two words, hij Dodge the hijack. Says the children were bonded out until the age of 21 by the county courts, just like their poor white counterparts. Okay, so now we're starting to hear that there were poor white people that were being put in the same uh, indenture apprenticeship program, which, you know, we know. So we got a number 10 here. So let's see what the number 10 is telling us about. So it says North Carolina and Virginia enacted apprenticeship laws similar to those in England. In 1646, Virginia passed a law giving justice of the peace at their own discretion the right to bind out children of the poor to avoid sloth and idleness wherewith such children are easily corrupted as also for the relief of such parents whose poverty extends not to give them breeding so basically what we got going on here is that you have parents who are very destitute like they can barely take care of their children so this law would you know i, I is it's crazy to think that someone would ever do this but this law would make it so that you could bound out your kid to somebody they go live with this person for years you guys just heard it like 20 something years so these people would feed your children, take care of them. God knows what else they were doing to them, um, teaching them, you know, some kind of skill or trade. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate that that had to happen. Um, you know, I can't even imagine that today. Um, you know, that being something. But again, this information can be found in Henning Statues at Large. Again, if you have not read Hending statues at large. I recommend that you do so. Um, trust me, it's a very long, uh, boring read, but I mean, it's got some important information in there. So, check on the chat here. Home of the Braves, what's good, my brother? Salute to you. So, again, appreciate everybody that's in here checking out the live stream. Just covering some information we didn't get to go over last time. All right, y'all. So back to it. So it says in July 1733, the North Carolina General Assembly received complaints from divers inhabitants or divers, my bad, divers inhabitants that. So it says divers and somebody may want to look up what this divers means. Maybe maybe there's a etymology or a definition. So divers or diver. Yeah, divers, free people, Negroes and mulattoes residing in this province were bound out until they came to 31 years contrary to the consent of the parties bound out. The said committee further report that they fear that divers persons will desert the settlement of those parts. So, I, you know, I just want to make another observation that it seems to me... Um, that slavery isn't what we're thinking it is um you know allegedly it's been going on since the 1600s but everything that i read everything that i see i don't really see anyone in the chateau slavery um you know just my observation you know everybody's um privy to their own you know understanding of what they're what they're saying but this is my understanding. All right. So it says the General Assembly ruled that those illegally bound should be released. The practice of binding out children to 31 years of the age was to cease. And the children were to be bound out for the same term as white children. 
All right, now this again in brackets says Saunders Colonial Records. So this is where this can be found if you want to look into it. So we got this little number 11. So let's read what it says. Um, Carteret County. Um, forgive me, uh, home of the Braves, so I'm saying that wrong. Um, I'm just, I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Carteret County. However, continue the practice of binding mixed race children until the age of 31, at least until 1759. This attitude of the court may explain why free African Americans made up only 0.3% of the free Carteret County population in 1790. Craven and Granville counties, on the other hand, bound out free African American girls until the age of 18. The same as for white girls. So, so we're getting some we're getting some gems dropped here. If y'all not paying attention to this, and free African Americans made up almost five percent of the free population of these counties in 1790. So, it says 4.6 and 4.9 percent, respectively. And then here again in brackets, it says heads of families, North Carolina, number 10, Craven Minutes. 1764 to 66 we got 50d uh, 1779 to 84 79a 1784 to 86 49a 1786 to 87 26b and granville minutes uh 1792 to 95 65 92 okay so that's where that information can be found all right so let me jump back into the chat see how we doing up in here what's good johnny everhart peace brother oh johnny um the reason why is because this particular information i'm reading from like i said it's just the introduction but a lot of it does have to do with uh, north carolina and virginia and south carolina so my bad on that but yeah um that's just the the uh sections that they cover so all right y'all um the children were bound out as apprentices and various crafts some apprentices were bound to learn the art trade and mystery of farming and others were trained as coopers um excuse me coppers blacksmiths cord waners and other useful occupations all right it says the uh, november 1774 birdie county court ordered um eight-year-old jemima wiggins and 10-year-old mary beth wiggins bastard mulattoes of sarah wiggins bound out to john skinner however this order was reversed in the may 1775 court session when Edward Wiggins, the children's father, convinced the court of said Skinner's ill and deceitful behavior procuring said order. So again, here in brackets as Han Birdie County Court Minutes. All right. So next we got the court bound out the children of many free African-American women who were not married or who were in common law wives of slaves but doll burnett argued against the binding out of her children edith and uh, may 28th 1777 johnston county court and it says in the court taking the conduct character and circumstances of the said doll burnett into consideration and finding no just reason to apprehend that the said edith would become a charge to this county ordered her to be returned to the care of her said mother again. So we can see in some of these court instances, you know, not everybody you know that they tried to put into this program, you know, had to go, you know, you could fight it. Um, you know, in cases they, you know, returned your child back to you. So again, that's going to be Han Johnston County court minutes. All right. That's where that can be found. All right. So it says in some instances, the indentured laws virtually enslaved a person for life. Okay, so 
Here we go again. George Cummins had the indenture of his white servant woman named Christian Finney extended by a year and her child bound for 31 years by order of the December 7, 1736 Carteret County Court because she had a mulatto bastard child during her service. She may have been a common law wife of a slave for she was charged with having another mulatto born July 10, 1739 and another on December 20th, 1743. It says when she applied to the court for her freedom on June 9, 1744, the court ruled that she served for another five months to pay for the cost of the court suit against her. When she again applied for her freedom six months later, the court ruled that on checking the record, she that she served another year since she had a mulatto child in the time of her servitude. All right. Again, uh, in brackets, minutes 1743, 47, full 33C, full 58, 59B-C, 62D, 151-2. All right. So it says some unscrupulous masters treated their apprentices like slaves. So, you know, they keep saying it time and time again where we where we're starting to see what this slavery might have been like. On September 21st, 1742, David Lewis brought John Russell, a six-year-old mixed-race boy, into Craven County Court, requesting that he be bond to him and promising to cause to be learned the said boy to read and write a legible hand and teach him or cause to be taught the shoemaker's trade. However, Lewis made a, a present of the said boy to his brother John Lewis of Chowan County and his brother sold the boy to Captain Hughes of Suffolk County, Virginia. And that is Craven County Court Minutes is where you can find this information. So they just keep passing these kids on and on and on to keep this going. All right. Uh, let me jump back into the chat. Peace to everybody on the mixed cloud side. I uh, appreciate y'all. All right. All right, y'all. So let's get back into it. So between 1759 and 1786, there were 16 African American apprentices in Craven County who, at the completion of their indentures, had to petition the court for their freedom. The court ruled in favor of the petitioners in every case. All right, so does that sound like a uh, chateau slavery going on forever and ever to you? All right, again, this is where these minutes can be found. Uh, we have a little number 12, and let's see what that's about. So the Craven County Court also ruled in favor of three African Americans who were born free elsewhere but held in bondage in Craven County between 1770 and 1778. Again, uh, the minutes are listed where this can be found in that assuming that would be Craven County Court. All right. Give me one second. Yeah. All right. We back to it. So it says Caleb Locklear was bound apprentice to Stephen Cade who assigned him to Francis Kennedy, who assigned him to James O'Neill, who assigned him to Thomas Hadley, who refused to release him from his indenture until ordered to do so by the July 20, uh, 27th, 1786 Cumberland County Court. Then again, here in brackets, the minutes 17... 1784-7 Thursday, July 27, 1786. So again, um, this is kind of how so we're kind of seeing this little system here how this is working. So these these people are just passing these kids on to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. All right. <clears throat> 
So John Harris, a white Hyde County carpenter, found guilty of begetting a bastard child by Mary Burrow, a white spinster, who required by law to support her. However, in June 1750, 1756, when a child was about two months old, two months old, the court learned that the child was mixed race. Harris was compensated for his expense by binding the child, a mulatto named George, to him for 21 years. So again, that's high county court minutes. All right. Next, we got Robert West Sr., Advertised in the North Carolina Gazette of New Bern on March 13, 1752 uh, for Thomas Bowman as if he were a runaway slave. Ran away from the subscribers on Roanoke River, a Negro fellow named Thomas Bowman, a very good blacksmith. Near six feet high, he can read, write, and cipher. Whoever will apprehend him shall be paid 12 pistols besides what the law allows. Again, this information here in brackets can be found in Fouts, North Carolina Gazette of New Bern. All right. So you guys know there's the uh, newspaper thing that you can subscribe to uh, that gives you historical uh, information. It's also a good uh, thing to use for genealogy purposes as well. All right. So almost 20 years later, Thomas Bowman was a taxable free mulatto in John Moore's household and Bertie County tax list of 1771, 72 and 1774. A South Carolinian advertised in the North Carolina Central and Fayetteville Gazette on July 25, 1795 for Nancy Oxidine, daughter of Charles Oxidine of, Rob of uh, Robinson County. $10 reward to deliver to the subscriber in Georgetown, a musty servant woman named Nancy Oxendine. She is a stout wench of a light complexion, about 30 years old. It is supposed she has been, and it's got these question mark, L's away by her brother and sister. The latter lives in Fayetteville. And then again, this can be found here in brackets. Fouts newspaper of Eddington, Fayetteville, in Hillsboro. All right, moving on. We also find cases where children were willingly bound by their parents to neighbors, friends, and relatives. Okay, so now we're reading that, you know, people who knew each other were bonding out kids, you know, to go to go work and live with, you know, either other friends or neighbors or family members. So Lovey Bass bound out her illegitimate child, Nathan, to her neighbor, George Anderson, who was probably the boy's father. George devised his land to Nathan and his farm animals to Lovey Bass, but left his wife and children only a shilling each. So to me, that sounds like that was probably the case. So he probably liked this woman, they had a kid together, and he gave them all the stuff and gave his reg regular family uh not much and then again this is uh, original 1771 granville county will is where that can be found other apprenticeships were simply a way for a person to acknowledge responsibility for a child's support mary bibby a black taxable had a base born child named fanny who was bound out to amy ingram and in butte butte county on May 13, 1772. And then here in brackets, it says Warren County, uh, WBA 227. However, Mary had been living in the Ingram household for at least 10 years prior to this. She and a slave named Charles were black taxable in Jesse Ingram's household in Gideon Macon's list for Goodwin's district of Granville County in 1761. And she and Charles were taxable in the Ingrams household in Butte County. Tax list of William Person in 1771. Mary was Charles' common law wife, according to a June 28, 1893 letter from a Bibby descendant, uh, Narcissa Ratley, to her children. 
All right, so we got this little number 13, which we'll probably get to here in a minute. We'll see what that's all about. So it says some masters took the apprenticeship seriously. In Birdie County on September 26, 1768, seven-year-old Frederick James, natural son of Anne James, was bound as an apprentice to John Norwood. And about 50 years later, on February 25th, 1817, we find Frederick James able to write his own Birdie County will in good handwriting. Then again, here in brackets, this is original at North Carolina Archives, if you want to look this up. All right, so that number 13 that we saw up there. So Narcissa Radley's letter is in the possession of Robert Jackson of Silver Springs, Maryland. A copy is at the end of the Pettiford family file. So there you go. All right, so let's check out this sell into slavery thing. Let's see what this is all about. So um, I believe we have someone in here in the uh, chat that is a tan. I thought I saw that. Kyle, what was good, my brother? Peace to you. All right, let me go back here. Some more people in here. Uh, let's see here. All right. So let's see. We got a bad job. Brother Lawrence. Peace to you, brother. Good to see you. Uh, Jay Free. Peace, peace. Good to see you. Uh, D Hayden. Appreciate you being here. Uh, let's see. Peace, my brother. Kiowa again. Petawaste. Uh, Miss Parker. Good to see you, sis. Honor. Thank you. Yeah, when you come in, please definitely bang the like button. Much appreciated. All right, y'all. So sell into slavery. Um, again, like I say, we do have, uh, I saw somebody in here who is a tan. Uh, peace to you. Uh, so free African-Americans were also in danger of having their children stolen and sold into slavery. In his Revolutionary War pension application on March 7th, 1834, Jury Tan declared in Southampton County, Virginia court that he was stolen from his parents when a small boy by persons unknown to him who were carrying him to sell him into slavery and had gotten with him and other stolen property as far as the mountains on their way. That his parents made complaint to a Mr. Tanner Alford who was then a magistrate in the county of Wake State of North, Ca North Carolina to get, to get me back from those who had stolen me. And he did pursue the rogues and overtook them at the mountains and took me from them. All right, so, um, like I said, we had somebody in here who was a tan, so I don't know if they had ever heard that story um adrian yes yeah, so i don't know if you've ever heard that story but um yeah that's that's uh powerful uh miss neither peace to you sis uh jim mohawk peace to you as well appreciate y'all for being here all right y'all um so again this is uh found in the national archives um there's also a fold three image um let me see if I can copy this and I'll drop it in the uh, chat for y'all. I like to do that whenever I can. So um, anybody that like to go and read about this story, you can do so. All right, y'all. So there is that link. There we go. If you want to go back and check that out. All right. So it says an advertisement in the April 10th, 1770 issue of the North Carolina Gazette of New Bern described how the Driggers family was victimized in Craven County, North Carolina. All right. So it says broken to the house under the care of Ann Driggers, a free Negro woman, two men in disguise with marks on their faces and clubs in their hands, beat and wounded her terribly and carried away four of her children. All right, again, this story can be found in the Fouts, North Carolina Gazette of New Bern. All right, that's where you can find this. 
and John Scott, freeborn Negro, testified in Berkeley County, South Carolina on January 17, 1754, that three men, Joseph David, William David, and Zachariah Martin, entered by force the house of his daughter, Amy Holly, and carried her off with her six children, and he thinks they are taking them north to sell the slaves. One of the children was recovered in Orange County, North Carolina, where the county court appointed Thomas Chavis to return a child to South Carolina on March 12, 1754. Again, here in brackets, you can see the court minutes where this can be found. Stealing free African Americans to sell them into slavery in another state was not a crime in North Carolina until 1779. Again, this is in Clark State Records of North Carolina. However, free African Americans were afforded some protection under the law. Again, Clark State Records of North Carolina. In 1793, the murderer of John James, a Northampton County, uh, excuse me, of Northampton County, was committed to jail according to the March 20th, 1793 issue of the North Carolina Journal. Last night, Harris Allen, who was committed for the murder of John James, a free mulatto of Northampton County, made his escape from the goal of this town. He is a remarkable tall man and had on a short round jacket. All right, again, this is in the North Carolina Journal. All right, so next we are going to get into uh, the services in the Revolutionary War. All right. So again, I hope you guys are uh, pulling out some of these gems that are being dropped and catching them. But yes, yeah, continue on. So many of the families in, th in this history have at least one member who fought in the Revolutionary War. Over 420 freeborn African Americans served in the Revolution from Virginia, another 390 from North Carolina, and 40 from South Carolina. All right, so we got another link here, and I would highly recommend checking this link out. Uh, you might find some of your ancestors uh, on this. So let me drop this real quick, and we'll get back to it. Hey, Jay Free, again, at the beginning, I, I don't want to have to say uh, dodge the hijack every 10 seconds. So we, we know that the word African-American wasn't being used. So please understand and overstand, please. I just don't want to have to say it 50 times. Dodge the hijack every time that word comes up. So please, for everybody in here, dodge the hijack with the African-American word. We, we all know this by now. You guys know me. You know, I say this. I have to read what's being written down. I know they weren't called African-American. All right. Army pay probably helped fund additional land purchases and this service alongside whites established long lasting friendships. Justice William Bryan of Johnston County testified in court for Holiday Haithcock. All right. So that name uh, for those in the chat, uh, the surname is uh, a big deal for us. Um, in support of his application for a Revolutionary War pension on September 21st, 1834, explaining that in the times of our Revolutionary War, free Negroes and mulattoes mustered in the ranks with white men. This affiant has frequently mustered in company with said free Negroes and mulattoes. So, um, it says that class of persons were equally liable to the draft and frequently volunteered in the public service. And H. Thompson Vanable wrote for him to the commissioner of pensions in Washington. The case of Holiday Haycock of North Carolina has been suspended merely because he was a free man of color. As we understand that several cases of this sort have been admitted you will oblige us by having it admitted. 
All right, again, this is found in the uh, National Archives. And I'll drop this link if anybody's interested on seeing his military service records. Like I said, I like to drop these uh, links for you guys to go and do your own research on. All right. So Charles Robinson Key, a leading citizen of Northampton County, testified that he knew Jury Walden for more than 20 years and that no man, not James Polk himself, is of better moral character. All right. So again, National Archives, where you can find these uh, roles to look up this information. All right. So again, you can go back with any of the stuff I'm mentioning in these brackets. You can, you know, pause the video, go back, watch it, and look up these things. All right, the Free Negro Code. Let's see what this is about. Many free African American families sold their land in the early 19th century and headed west or remained in North Carolina as poor farm laborers. This was probably the consequence of a a combination of deteriorating economic conditions and the restricted free Negro code. Beginning in 1826 and continuing through the 1850s, North Carolina passed a series of restrictive laws termed the Free Negro Code by John Hope Franklin. Free African Americans lost the right to vote and were required to obtain a license to carry a gun. Tensions arriving from Nat Turner's slave rebellion in nearby Southampton County, Virginia, played a major role in the passage of these laws. All right, so let's read number 14. I don't have any opinion either way on this Nat Turner stuff. Um, that's for you to decide. Uh, free African Americans arrested in House Southampton County after Nat Turner's rebellion included Arnold Artis, uh, Exum Artis, Barry Newsom, Thomas Haithcock, and Isham Turner. Artis, Haithcock, and Newsom were sent for further trial. And again, this can be found in Jury, the Southampton County Insurrection, 195 to 6. All right. So it's going to talk some more about this. So, with the whole state literally up in arms over Nat Turner's rebellion, delegates to the General Assembly from New Bern called on the assembly, setting forth the incompetency of free persons of color exercising the privilege of voting. Edmund B. Freeman, editor of the Roanoke Advocate, a Halifax County Weekly, boldly came to their support in the January 5th, 1832 issue. It cannot be denied that free Negroes taken in the mass are desolate and abandoned, yet there are some individuals among them, sober, industrious, and intelligent. Many are good citizens, and that they are sometimes good voters, we have the best proofs. We do think that too much prejudice is excited against the class of our population. But at the same time, there is a class of white-skinned citizens, equally low and abandoned, whose absence uh, would be little regretted. All right, this is in the North Carolina Archives microfilm. All right, moving on. If attitudes toward free African Americans was typical of white Halifax County residents, this would help to explain why free African Americans made up 18% of the free population of the county in 1810. The editor's backhanded compliment certainly compares well to the sentiments of Robinson County residents. The county of Robinson is cursed with a free colored population that migrated originally from the districts round about the Roanoke and Noose Rivers. They are generally they are generally indolent, roguish, improvident, and dissipated. And then here in brackets it says free, it says Franklin Free Negro in North Carolina, 79, citing MS and legislative papers for 1840 to 41. Schwinnegers race slavery and free black series 196 all right so 
anyone wants to read this, I want to try to copy this, um, this book. And I'll just drop it in the chat. David Corey was good. Arthur Gray, good to see you. All right, y'all, let me drop this book real quick in case anybody wants to look that up. All right. All right. It says, or a northern paper quoted in the January 5th, 1832 issue of the Roanoke Advocate complaining about the evils arising from the immigration of free blacks from other states into Pennsylvania. All right. So it says overrun by an influx of ignorant, indolent and depraved population from dangerous to the peace, rights and liberties of our citizens. All right. Again, here in brackets, North Carolina archives, microfilm. John Hope Franklin recorded a famous case in which Elijah Newsom of Cumberland County was prosecuted for carrying his gun into the county. Again, in brackets, Franklin Free Negro, North Carolina, 77, citing State versus Newsom, uh, 27, North Carolina, 183. However, Halifax County and Robinson County appeared to have granted gun licenses freely. These licenses were recorded in the county court records from 1841 through 1846. Again, we have a little number 15 here. Let's see what that says. By petition signed by five or more of their respectable neighbors, the August 18th, 1845 Halifax court issued gun licenses to, so we got Lem uh, Lemieux Morgan, Aaron, Arthur, and Gabriel Locklear, Matthew Jones, John Smith, Robert Mitchum, Fed Havecock, Fed Wilkins, Alex Jones, David Reynolds, Julius Flood, Ambrose Hawkins, Simon uh, Pernan, and William Jones. All right. So, uh, again, as I appreciate everyone being here, uh, definitely bang the like button on your way in. And uh, also get over to the Mixed Cloud and subscribe, please. So, here's the Mixed Cloud. I'm running both at the same time. So peace to everyone over there that's watching. All right, y'all. Let's see here. All right. The November 1841 Robinson County Court issued licenses using the form wherever as a colored man residing in this county by name do sustain a good moral character. Therefore, it is a judge that the said be permitted to bear firearms and use the same as any other good citizen of the community they were issued to uh, we got David Aaron and Alexander Oxendine Ishmael uh, Ethelred Nelson and Willis Roberts David Scott and William Goings Henry Sampson Abraham Jones we got George Mo Morgan Levy and Hector Locklear and John Blanks all right. So many of those who left the state were enumerated in the 1840-1860 census of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan. All right. Some went to Canada and a few to Haiti and Liberia. By 1847, when Henry Chavers or Chavis emigrated to Liberia, uh, life for Free African Americans in North Carolina must have been truly oppressive. A letter written for him to his friend Dr. Ellis Malone of Lewisburg in Franklin County describing Liberia sounds like that of a recently liberated slave. All right, so we do know some people, you know, did go to Liberia, a lot of people did not. Uh, it says this land of freedom, a nation of free and happy children, uh, they have to hitherto downcast and oppressed race. I now begin to enjoy life as a man should do. Did my colored friends only know or could they have seen what I already have seen? They would not hesitate a moment to come to this glorious country. All right, again, that's written by um, Henry Chavis. 
uh, describing Liberia. And again, this is uh, Ellis Malone Papers, NC, NUCMC, 21H, William R. Perkins Library, Duke University. All right, we got a number 16, and we'll see what that's about here in a minute. By 1870, many of those who remained behind were living in virtually the same conditions as the freed slaves. In the 1870 census for Northampton County, North Carolina, the most common occupation listed for those who were free before 1800 was farm laborer, the same occupation as the former slaves. Some married former slaves, and by the 20th century, they had no idea their ancestors had been free. So you guys have seen me quote this. All right. So that number 16, Bill, uh, Bell I. Wiley, understandably mistook Chavers for a recently manumitted slave, including this letter in his book, Slaves No More, 1980, University Press of Kentucky. I will drop this as, as well. I know we got a lot of researchers in here. I want you to verify the information I'm presenting. All right. Boom. All right. So I'm dropping books, sources, you know, when I can in, in the chat. All right. Our migration to South Carolina. Some members of the Gibson family moved to South Carolina in 1731 where a member of the Commons House of Assembly complained that several free colored men and their white wives had immigrated from Virginia. Governor Robert Johnson of South Carolina summoned Gideon Gibson and his family to explain their presence there and after meeting him and his family reported, I have had them before me in council and upon examination find that they are not Negroes nor slaves, but free people. That the father of them here is named Gideon Gibson, and his father was also free. I have been informed by a person who has lived in Virginia that this Gibson has lived there several years in good, good repute, and by his papers that he has produced before me, that his transactions there have been very regular, that he has for several years paid taxes for two tracts of land and had several Negroes of his own, that he is a carpenter by trade and is come hither for the support of his family. All right, so here in uh, brackets, we got box two bundle, South Carolina minutes of house of Burgesses, 1730 to 35. Number nine, Paris transcripts, New York, Historical Society by Jordan, white over black, 172. All right. Like the earlier settlers, excuse me, like the earlier settlers of North Carolina frontier, Governor Johnson was more concerned with the Gibson social class than their race. Many of the free African Americans who were counted in the census for South Carolina from 1790 to 1810 originated in Virginia or North Carolina. They were among the first settlers on the back country of South Carolina where they were granted land and formed com uh, communities. In what became Marion, Marlboro, Liberty, and Richland counties, they were. So these are going to be the surnames. So we got the Bass, Barry, Biddy, Bonner, Bowman, Bradley, Brave Boy, Brian, Bug, Bunch, Butler, Busby, Carter, Chavis, Clark, Collins, Combus, Combus, Combo, Demery, Driggers, Farrell, Gallimore, Gibson, Gowen, Grooms, Hagen, Hafecock, Harmon, Hatcher, Holly or Holly, Hayes, Hazel, Henderson, Hicks, Hilliard, Howard, Hewlin, Hunt, Ivy, Jacobs, Jeffries, Jones, Kersey, Lamb, Lockler, Lowry, Lucas, Matthews, Mitchum, Mosley, Mumford, Oxidine, Pavey, Rollins, Reed, Rouse, Russell, Scott, Shoecraft, Shoemaker, Sweat, Tan, Turner, Valentine, Weaver, Webb, Wilson, and Wynn. So I know I probably mentioned 
probably everybody in this chat probably got a surname that they just heard that they're associated with. So I had a couple in there. So I know y'all got some too. All right. So a Holly family with relatives in Northampton and Granville counties, North Carolina was in Berkeley County, South Carolina by 1754. All right, again in brackets, we got Orange County, North Carolina minutes, 1752.870-1. That's where that info can be found. So Winslow Driggers, James Bunch, Jacob Bunch, Ephraim Bunch, Gideon Bunch, Peter Rouse, Anthony Sweat, Barnett Sweat, and Thomas Sweat were in the South Carolina militias before 1760. All right, again, where this can be found, Clark, Colonial Soldiers of the South. All right, Colonial Soldiers of the South. Drop that in. You guys can look up that as well. Miss Mika, peace to you, sis. Cordero Miles, peace. All right, y'all. Copper Indian, peace. Good to see you. All right, y'all. So uh, any of the stuff I'm dropping in there are either links or, you know, books where you can look up some of this information and do your own research. All right. Families from Virginia, North Carolina, represented most of the free persons of color of present day Liberty and Marlboro counties, South Carolina, who petitioned the legislature legislature to repeal the discriminatory tax against free negroes on april 20th 1794. so we got richard evans uh nathaniel cumbo uh george collins william turner thomas hewlin spencer bolton william sweat uh solomon bolton james shoemaker shoemaker john turner jr solomon shoemaker samson shoemaker Thomas Shoemaker, so these are all Shoemakers, but we're going to read it like it says. Junior, Thomas Shoemaker Sr., John Shoemaker, James Shoemaker, David Collins, Thomas Collins, uh, John Turner Sr., Mildred Turner, Penelope Turner, Catherine Turner, Elias Hewlin, Cudworth Oxendine, um, Archmac Oxendine, Deli Gibson, and Drusella Gibson. Others who signed the petition were Isaac Mitchell, Jonathan Price, and Nathaniel Price, Stephen Gibson Jr., uh, says Driggers, James Ivey, Joseph Bass, and Levy Gibson were considered white when they signed in support of the petition. So understand what that's saying. Uh, South Carolina Department of Archives and History General Assessment Petition 1794 number 216 frames 370 to 374 free people of color st 1368 series number 165015 item 216 all right in 1806 female free persons of color of richland district petitioned against the uh, discriminatory tax against them so elizabeth harris dicey nelson uh, Lydney Harris, Keziah Harris, Clarissa Harris, Eleanor Harris, Catherine uh, Rawlinson, Elizabeth Wilson, Jerry Sweat, Sarah Jacobs, Sarah Wilson, Sarah Holly, Edie Wilson, Sarah Bolton, Nancy Grooms, Mary Jeffers, Sarah Jeffers, Mary Jacobs, Rachel Porty, and Sarah Porty, a variation of the name Poitras. So I have this genealogy as well. Uh, South Carolina Archives General Assembly petitions S165015, ND1885, frames 382 to 386. And sheriffs of Richland District complained to the General Assembly that between 1821 and 1824, he was unable to collect the tax of $4 each from Rachel Harris, John Harris, Eliza Harris, Jacob Harris, uh, Nasri Harris, Roland Harris, Russell Porty, Fanny Porty, Polly Oxendine, Rachel Oxendine, William Oxendine, Aisley Oxendine, Michael Wilson, Thomas Wilson, Rebecca Locklear, 
James Locklear, Philip Gibbs, Lydia Chavis, William Harris, Ephraim Wilson, Stark Harris, Jerry Harris, Gideon Gibson, Sarah Jacobs, Jay Jacobs, Keziah Jacobs, Essie Jacobs, Mary Chavis, Timothy Kersey, uh, Charlotte Chavis, Griffin Harris, and Sophia Sweat. Again, in brackets, we got South Carolina Archives, General Assembly Petitions, S165015, ND1796, frame 793, 17, uh, 797. All right. So it goes on to say that a uh, few colonial South Carolina County court records have survived, so it is not possible to determine the origin of all the free South Carolina families. However, at least three families were the descendant of white slave owners who left slaves and plantations to their mixed race children. So we got the Collins, Holman, and uh, Pendervis. James Pendervis um, expanded his father's holdings more than fourfold to 4,710 acres and 151 slaves. John Holman Jr. established a plantation with with uh, 57 slaves on the Santee River in Georgetown District and then returned to his homeland in uh, Rio Pongo, West Africa to resume the slave trading he learned from his English father. Okay. According to Coger, a free Indian, free Indians in Charleston were part of the free African American community. They married members of the free African American community and were members of the Brown Fellowship Society, an organization. So I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this Brown Fellowship Society. Might be something we want to dig on. An organization of lighter skinned men, which maintained the cemetery, operated a school for the children of its members and supported charity and social functions. Proof of descent from a free Indian allowed free African Americans to avoid the discriminatory state uh, capsation tax. So that's interesting that they're saying um, free Indian women. All right. Uh, we got Cougar again, Black Slave over Owners, 16-17, uh, South Carolina Department of Ar Archives and History Public Programs, Document Packet Number 1. A uh, free association of Indians and African Americans is also evident from their family genealogies. Rachel Gardner, a free musty, married Robert Baldwin, a free black man in Charleston on September 5th, 1801. Okay, so this is the part of the um, free African-American part that we had skipped over. So again, I wanted to cover that and I'm going to skip to, so we're going to start getting into the Indian portion of this. And we went over this part of it. So I want to finish up that. So let me, uh, give me a minute y'all to get to that. Um, but again, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, appreciate everyone for being here. All right, so let's get on down here to it. Yeah, we went over Joshua Perkins last time. Um, I believe where I left off is going to be the uh, Cypress family is what we're going to get into next. Uh, let's see here. Make sure I'm not skipping anything. Uh, see David Jennifer's. My apologies, y'all. I should have been ready with this. Uh, we went over the not Negro law. Yeah, so we covered that. And then I showed you guys this picture of the uh, Bass family. Justice Bass. Uh, we talked about Robeson County. Or excuse me, Robeson County. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so this is all that Robeson County stuff here. Yeah, 
see, I believe we cover the Lowry's as well. Okay, here we go. So we, we'll start here. So if I, if this sounds re repeated from last time, my apologies, but uh, so free Indians in the English community. There were Indians in Virginia who were not, who were not slaves. However, like Indian slaves who were assimilated into the African slave population, free Indians living among the English as well as those on reservations were assimilated into the free African American population. Molly Cochran, a free Indian woman from Goshen County, had a child by slave Negro Ben in August 1756. Um, let's see, Jones, the Douglas Register, 384. The children of Judah, Judah Cypress, an Indian woman from Surrey County, Virginia, married African Americans. Both families became part of the free African American community. We got John Teague, was an Indian tenant on land in Accomack County on September 8th, 1725. Uh, his likely descendants were Robert Teague, a mulatto taxable on himself and a horse in Northampton County, Virginia in 1787. And Sacker Teague, who registered as a free Negro in Accomack County, uh, born July 1785, a light, a light black, five feet, 10 and a half inches, born free. And then it says register of free Negroes. Next, we have Jacob Teague was a 63 year old man of color who appeared in the Accomack County Court in 1820 to apply for his pension for his service in the revolution. Again, National Archives is where you can find this. Um, also, this can be found on fold three. Let's see if I can get this on here. Here we go. So I'm going to drop this link here. Yeah, I know it's Kyle. That was, that was, that was weird. All right, there we go. All right, y'all. So next we got William Press, an Indian born of the body of a free Negro called Priscilla was fined for failing to list himself as a taxable in Northampton County, Virginia in 1730. And then we got the Myhalica loose paper, 1628-1731. So let's copy that as well and drop it for anyone who wants to check out this book as well. All right. Next, we got the descendant of David Penn, P-I-N-N, an Indian taxed in Benjamin George Chris Church Parish, Lancaster County household in 1745 and 1746. Were so much a part of the African American community by 1785 that a descendant left his estate to his wife with the proviso that she not marry a slave. Otherwise, it was to go to his sister, who was married to a member of the free African-American Nickens family. All right. Again, in uh, brackets, we have Le uh, Library of Virginia, Tithables, 1745-9516, Northumberland County Wills and Administration, number 80. Next, we have Ann Penn, registered in Lancaster County on September 19th, 1803 age 55 color black height 53 born free all right next we have archer bowerman or excuse me baumer son of a free indian woman registered in halifax county virginia on may 20th 1827 a dark mulatto man about 64 years of age gray woolly hair was born free all right some Indians with English with English surnames took their names from African American parents. Solomon Bartlett, born about 1727, a free mulatto living in Bertie County in 1772, was probably the ancestor of Solomon and Fanny Bartlett, born about 1800. 
who were counted in the 1808 Nottaway Indian Census. All right, so again, executive papers, June 21st to July 22nd, 1808, Governor William H. Cable, Box 154A, Library of Virginia. All right, next we got John Dunchy. A free mulatto received 30 lashes in July 1755 when he was convicted of the attempted rape of a white woman in Brunswick County, Virginia. He was probably the grandfather of John Dungey, a Pamunkey Indian descendant from the Aborigines of this dominion, who petitioned the Virginia legislature to allow his wife, the daughter of a slave and her slave owner to remain in Virginia in 1825. Again, in brackets, King William County Legislative Petition, December 19th, 1825, Library of Virginia. All right, next we have Francis Skipper, was married to Anne, a Negro woman, before 1671, when the Norfolk County Court ruled that she was tithable. They may have been the ancestor of George Skipper, one of the Nottaway Indians who sold land in Southampton County on February 2nd, 1749. All right, so we're going to talk about the Bass family. The history of the Bass family, a mixed race, non saman and English family, illustrates the position of culturally English Indians, in English Indians, Americans in Virginia and North Carolina. Their ancestor, John Bass of Norfolk County, Virginia, married an Indian woman in 1638. Okay, so. Um, we we've heard the the history on the bass uh the actual bass family uh were more than likely uh black europeans it says there is no evidence that the family ever adopted any indian customs or married another indian in norfolk county john bass's son william bass purchased land in norfolk county in 1729 william's son edward bass purchased land there in 1699 and had normal dealings in the county court, all right? William's daughter, Mary Bass, was a mistress of two white children who were bound to her by the Norfolk County Court on June 8th, 1714. William Bass obtained a certificate from the Norfolk County Court in 1727. An inquest pertaining to possessions and use of cleared and swamplands, William Bass Sr. and his kinsmen are persons of English, and Nansaman Indian descent with no admixture of Negro Ethiopic blood. All right. William Bass's son, by the same name William Bass II, described as tall and swarthy, also obtained a certificate of Indian ancestry from the Norfolk County Court on September 20th, 1742. And then here in brackets it says Bell. Bass families of the South. So if anybody has any interest in reading this, I'll drop this as well. Yeah, I know. I know Cordero. That that African American word, it it, it it annoys me as well but you know again we just gotta you know dodge that hijack unfortunately um his descendants were at least as much african as indian since he married sarah lavina so i'm not sure where they're getting this african thing from again dodge the hijack the mulatto daughter of a negro woman slave named jean lavina in 1729 about 70 years later, on May 27, 1797, their grandson obtained a excuse me obtained a certificate from Norfolk County Court, stating that he was of English and Indian descent and is not a Negro, nor whatever that means, YT a mulatto, as by some falsely and malicious stated, and that he was the son of Sarah Lavina. A virtuous woman of Indian descent. All right, so we got a number 20 here. Let's see what this says. 
other free African-American families, Anderson, Weaver, Perkins, Bright, Newton, and Price, were issued certificates of Nazaman Indian ancestry by the Norfolk Court on 15th and, 20, 15th and 20th July, 1833. Again, says C. Bell Bass Families of, of the South, chapter on Nazaman Indian ancestry of some Bass families. All right. So William II, Bass's brother, came to North Carolina in the early 18th century, and their descendants settled in Northampton, Bertie, and Granville counties. Those who settled in Northampton and Bertie counties proposed, or excuse me, prospered, and were among the larger landowners in the county. They married whites, and most were considered white after a few generations. The Granville branch of the family were relatively small landowners, who married free African Americans and were considered African American after a few generations. All right, so you guys see the the hijack here. One of the Granville County descendants, William Bass, was called Free Negro in an undated Granville County court presentation. Another William Bass was the foster son of a slave in Marlboro District, South Carolina. His his extraordinary case illustrates both the extent which the family intermarried with African Americans and the degree of repression suffered by free African Americans in the mid 19th century. On December 14, 1859, he petitioned the legislature to become the slave of Philip W. Pledger, explaining that his position as a free person of color, a Negro, is more degrading and involves more suffering in this state than that of a slave he is preyed upon by every sharper with whom he comes in contact and is charged with the punish for every offense guilty or not committed in the neighborhood and lives a thousand times harder and in more uh, destitution than the slaves of many planters yeah I'm, okay so again, here in brackets, uh, police control of the slave in South Carolina, 196, citing the Charleston Courier. And let's see what this 21 says. Philip Pledger may emancipated or been related to Morris Pledger, head of an Anson County, North Carolina household of six other free in 1800. All right, so let's get into uh, Indian reservations here. By the mid 18th century, Indians on Virginia's reservations were too few in number to have continued to exist solely through endogenous relationships. One of the largest reservation tribes were the Genghis Skins, who were assimilated into the African American population of Northampton County, Virginia by the early 1800s. Likewise, the Pamunkey and, Mat and Mattapanai Indians of King William County, Virginia, married African Americans in the area surrounding their reservations. In 1708, there was a Pamunkey Queen, uh, Queen Anne, and 12 great men. Mr. Yonks, Mr. John, Mr. Poe White, Tho Beck, Fra Macau, Sham Marin, Henry Marshall, James Corvin, Thos Rogers or Thomas Rogers, Charles, uh, Charles Thomas Sikeswa, and John Hicks. So again, here in brackets says Palmer Calendar of Virginia State Papers 127-8. Forty years later, in 1748, the tribe had only seven men, five of whom were related to each other. George Langston, John Langston, William Langston. George Taha, John Sampson, Thomas Cook, and Thomas Sampson. They have been um, afflicted with long and grievous sickness and debts for medicines, doctors' attendance, corn, clothing, and other, necess and, and other necessaries they were unable to pay. Petitioned the governor to allow them to sell a tract of land of 88 acres which was four miles from their town. All right, again, this is in brackets, Winfrey, the Laws of Virginia, 416-7. 
it is likely that the Langston, Samson, and Cook families descended from non pamunkey men. The Langston family apparently descended from Indian Langston, who was paid by the Henrico County Court on uh, October 12, 1691, for killing wolves. And the Sampson family likely descended from John Sampson, a free mulatto who lived in Elizabeth City County in 1715. Here in brackets, it says, see the Sampson family history. In the 1750s, a Mush family descended, descendants of Chickahominy Indian James Mush joined the community. And by the time of the revolution, there were members of the Major family who may have been related to free Eastern Shore Indian Peter Major. African slaves, Daja Hijack, and the Indian slave named Cook. And this in brackets says Cook George Freedom Suits 1796, Mary Freedom Suits 1804, Major Freedom Suit 1801, Accomack County African American Digital Collection, Library of Virginia, see Major Family History. On September 12, 1771, the slave owner advertised in the Virginia Gazette that his yellow complexion slave Frank had run off to his Pamunkey wife. The Revolutionary War pension files of John Collins and Stephen Freeman indicate that the Pamunkey and Mattapanai Indian communities were part of the free African American communities in surrounding counties and grew up with each other as children in the 1760s. All right, again, we have some uh, National Archives uh, links here. And we got a full three link. Okay, so free African-American families that married into the tribes included the Adams, Allman, Arnold, Bradby, Brisby, Collins, uh, Cooper, Custolo, Dickey, Dungy, Edwards, Freeman, Hills, Holmes, Holt, Key, Miles, Mills, Page, Sweat, Two Pence, Willer, Willie, and Wynn. All right, so number 22 says, Abraham Sweat, head of a Halifax County, North Carolina household of five other free in 1790, left the Halifax County will in 1819, by which he uh, divided his estate amongst his grandchildren, John Langston, son of Judah, and Lucy Cook. All right, so Molly Hope, Rody Arnold, Billy Sampson and Squire Osborne, free Negroes, all free persons of color, were heirs of John Freeman. Um, it says who died while serving in the revolution, according to testimony by Jane Collins, a free woman of color. All right, again, National Archives, another faux three link. Nancy Major died from domestic violence in Henrico County in 1819, according to the testimony of Agnes Langston. And the slave who testified to a Henrico County coroner's inquest that Nancy's slave husband was in the habit of beating his wife severely and frequently, and that Nancy had died after one such beating. All right, again in brackets, we got Major uh, Nancy Major, Coroner's Inquest, 1819, African American Narrative, Library of Virginia. Several members of the Langston, Sampson, and Major families moved to Petersburg and registered there as free Negroes in the early 19th century. Uh, Minerva Gunn, an Indian of the Pamunkey tribe, married, married Austin Curtis, a free Negro in Petersburg, and immigrated with him to Liberia in 1823, as did three members of the Sampson family. All right. I'm going to drop this link because this may have some information about some library stuff in it. Uh, grab that. Drop that in here. Rodimez, what's good, brother? All right, y'all. Anthony Williams, peace. All right, got you. Got you, Anthony. All right, y'all. So it says, so we're getting to the end of this. It says 143 whites in King William County, Virginia, petitioned the legislator on January 20th, 1843, concerning the Pamunkey tribe, saying they all have one fourth or more of Negro blood. Not an individual can be found amongst them of whose grandfathers and grandmothers 
one or more is or who was not a Negro. So again, this is these people's opinions. That's all it is. Their land is now inhabited by two uncorporated bands of free mulattoes in the midst of a large slave holding community. It says the Pamunkey submitted a counter petition in which they claimed that there are many here that are more than half blooded Indian. Though we regret to say that there are some here that are not of our tribe. Uh, Pamunkey Indians counter petition King William County. 1843-01-21 Legislative Petitions Digital Collection Library, Virginia. By the 1850s, the Pamunkeys were frequenting Richmond, Terrell, Richard, Edward, and Pleasant Bradby advertised in the Richmond newspaper for the return of their free papers, which they had lost in Richmond, Pleasant, er, excuse me, which they had lost in Richmond. Pleasant Miles attempted to have his wedding reception there in 1853 but the police broke it up because of the law against the free Negroes congregating together in large numbers. 16 of the 20 guests were free Negro residents of Richmond. Four were from the Indian town. The July 1853 edition of the Richmond Morning Mail reported that the mayor had called to the attention of his police officers that a large number of half-bred Indians or rather descendants of the Pamunkey tribe, who by intermarriage were ne excuse me, by intermarriage with Negroes, had obtained all traces of their originality, were congregating in the city, and as far as he could prevent it, they would not be allowed to settle here. All right. In the case of uh, Richard Badby, the mayor argued that if his father were a Negro, the prisoner was no more an Indian than would the offspring of a white woman by a black man be white. The kinky hair and general appearance of the accused was such to uh, convince him that he was nothing more than a free Negro. And he should therefore find him a dollar for being drunk and commit him to prison as a free Negro without a register. All right, so let's drop. Uh, Richard Bradby's link here. All right, let me grab that real quick for y'all. Somebody wants to check him out. Boom. There you go. All right. So Rhoda Sampson, a descendant of the Pamunkey Indians, was a resident of Richmond between 1854 and 1860 when she appeared in addition of several newspapers after getting into fights. Once with a slave and once with Betsy Martin, a free negress, um, an associate. All right. Then it goes on to say by 1900, descendants and spouses of just one free mulatto toward an almond represented 41 of 50 persons on the Mattapanai Reservation and 31 of 84 on the Pamunkey Reservation. See the Almond Family History, the 1900 Census for King William County. All right, so I've showed this picture of these people before. So this is the Almond Family. All right. Um, it says Alexander Almond, son of Thornton Almond and his wife Dicey, Major of King William County Pamunkey Indians Smithsonian Institute photo number 895. So here's the photo. Here they are. All right. And then down here we have Lee Major and his wife Sarah Langston Major of Pamunkey shown in the Mattapanai Indian Town circa 1900 Smithsonian Institution photo number 851A. So here they are. So hopefully everyone can see this okay. All right, moving on. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, Gangaskin Indians of Northampton County, Virginia, said to be as numerous as all other tribes. And the county put together numbered only 30 persons by 1769. 
1812, 11 adult members of the tribe petitioned the governor to allow the sale of their lands. Six of the petitioners bore the name of African-American families that had been born free in Northampton County since the colonial period. So we had the Bevins slash Bibbins, Carter, Collins, Drighouse, Driggers, and Francis. All right, in brackets it says, trustees of the Gigaskin Tribe of Indians petition Northampton County, 1812-12-02, legisl excuse me, legislative petitions, digital collection, Library of Virginia. All right. Um, petitioner Edmund Press, descended from William Press, born 1706, an Indian who was born in Accomack County, of the body of a free Negro called Priscilla. In 1828, the clerk of Northampton County Court stated that their descendants were respectable free Negro landowners. The nearest thing to a census of the reservation is provided by the deeds by which Indians living on tribal land sold or leased their lands. The deeds were signed by the chief men and women of the tribe, the principal members of the Nottaway and Nansamon living in present day Southampton County were. So we have King Edmonds, James Harrison, Ned Peter Robert Scholar, Sam Wonoke, uh, let's see, Robin, uh, William Hines, Frank Wonoke, and Robin Jr. We got um, Cochran's Tom and Cochran's Will in 1735. We also have Sam, Frank, Jack, Will, John Turner. We got Watt, Bailey, and George Skipper. John Turner and Celia Rogers, a non Saman Indian, and Sucky Turner in 1795. And again, that says Surrey County DB, number 8, 550, Southampton County DB, 1987714. All right. So between 1734 and 1756, the Nottaway had been so reduced by the want of the common necess necessities of life, sickness, and the other casualties that the Virginia legislator legislature allowed them to sell a total of 18,000 acres of their land in Southampton County. Uh, says they use land sales and leases to support themselves. There were only six adults and 11 children in the census taken in 1808. See, the adults were Littleton Scholar, Tom Turner, uh, Jimmy Wonok, Edie Turner, Nancy Turner, and Betsy Stepp. Children were Tom Stepp, Henry Turner, Alexander Rogers, John Woodson, Winnie Woodson, Annie Woodson, Polly Woodson, Fanny Bartlett, Solomon Bartlett, Billy Woodson, and uh, Jenny Woodson. It says no adult children, no adult children was married to or sharing a household with any other adult Indian. Determination and dispersal of the Nottaway Indians of Virginia is in brackets. A legislative petition from Southampton County in 1818 reported that their husbands and wives are chiefly free Negroes. The Piscataway Indians living in Richmond County, Virginia, were named in a court case in September 1704. So we got young Toby, Long Tom, Jack, the Fiddler, old Mr. Thomas, Bearded Jack, Jimmy, Harry, Capoose, and bearded jack so a bunch of names we really can't tie anybody to um members of the sapani in orange county virginia were mentioned in a court case in 1742 1743 in which they were charged with stealing a hog and burning the woods so we got alex mccarton john bowling manissa craft tom isaac harry blind tom foolish jack uh, Charles Gibb, John Collins, and Little Jack. All right, again, uh, names, they, some some surnames are in there, but most of them are just, you know, you can't really tell who's who. The names of the Piscataway Indians living in Richmond County, Virginia, were mentioned in a court case in September 1704. Young Toby, Long Tom, Jack the Fiddler, Oh, Mr. Thomas, Bearded Jack, Jimmy, Harry, Capuccio. Yeah, so we read that. 
We read the uh, Pawnee, uh, North Carolina reservations. Some of the names of the Chowan tribe were recorded in Chowan County deeds by which they sold their land on Bennett's Creek in 1734 in what was later Gates County. They were Charles Beasley, James Bennett, Thomas Hoyter, Jeremiah Pushens, John Redding, and John Robbins, and excuse me, Noose Will. Since there were only two men and five women and children in the tribe in 1754, when the surviving members of the tribe sold the last 400 acres of their 11,360 acre patent in 1790, they were described as a parcel of Indian women, which has mixed with Negroes, and now there are several freemen and women of mixed blood, as Affer said, which has descended from the said Indian. The said freedmen did in the late contest with Great Britain behave themselves as good and faithful soldiers. All right. So number 23 is Kinston Robbins was one of the sundry persons of color of Hereford County who petitioned the General Assembly in 1822 to repeal the act which declared slaves to be competent witnesses against free African-Americans. The soldiers were probably members of the Reed family. All right. So this is... Parker David Robbins, Raleigh, North Carolina Museum of History, North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources. This gentleman here. All right. So Parker David Robbins, soldier, legislator, and inventor, born in Birdie County, the son of John A. Robbins, a mulatto with Chowan Indian ancestors. Robbins was regarded as a free black man. He was one of the 15 blacks elected to the 1868 Constitutional Convention and one of the 19 blacks elected to the 1869-70 term in the State House of Representatives. All right, so I'm definitely going to drop this link real quick. Anybody wants to read up on this gentleman here? What's good, sweet KJ? Jarrell Mitchell, peace. Again, if you're just coming into the live stream, please bang the like button if you already haven't. All right, y'all. So about 300 Tuscarora men, women, and children were living on 40,000 acres in Birdie County between 1752 and 1761. The tribe never gave up its Indian customs. They still required an interpreter in 1752. Their numbers had been reduced to 260 in 1766 when they leased part of their land. 155 members of the tribe moved to the state of New York after the 1766 lease and the remainder joined them in 1802. So again, this can be found in Swanton's Indian Tribes of North America. And I believe that's probably page 87. So again... Let me drop this down here for y'all. So I just want you guys to have all these different books and sources where you can check all this stuff out. What's good, Jenna? All right. So it says, since they left the Southeast, it is difficult to determine the extent to which they mixed with the free African-American population of Birdie County. However, the colonial Birdie County uh, records, which have been abstracted by Winnet Parks Hahn, do not indicate any interactions between the English colonial community and the Indians other than the sale of their lands, which are recorded in the deeds of 1766 and 1777, by which they leased over 80, excuse me, 8,000 acres of land in the southwest corner of Birdie County between the Roanoke River and Roquist uh, Pocasin. To the Attorney General, their names were James Allen, Sarah Basket, Thomas Basket, William Basket, Betty Blunt, Billy Blunt Sr., Billy Blunt Jr., Edward Blunt, George Blunt, Sarah Blunt, Thomas Blunt, Billy Blunt Jr., Samuel Bridgers, William Kane, John Kane, Molly Kane, uh, Walnut Charles Jr., Walnut Charles Sr., Billy Cornelius, 
Charles Cornelius, Isaac Cornelius, Billy Dennis, Sarah Dennis, Billy George, uh, Snip Nose George, Watt Gibson, James Hicks, John Hicks, Sarah Hicks, uh, Sinclair Thomas, Hal, Tom Jack, Captain Joe, John Lightwood, Isaac Miller, James Mitchell, Billy Mitchell, Billy Needoff, Billy Owens, John Owens, Nan Owens, William Pugh, John Randall, Billy Roberts, Tom Roberts Jr., John Rogers, Harry Samuel, John Sinclair, Thomas Sinclair, Ben Smith, John Smith, Molly Smith, Thomas Smith, Billy Saki, William Taylor, Richards Thomas, uh, Tom Thomas, Louis Tough Dick, Wes Whitmill, Tough Dick, Whitmill Tough Dick, um, Isaac Wheeler, James Wiggins, John Wiggins, Molly Wallenoak, and Betty, Betty alone. All right. It says the uh, Cherokee lived in the mountainous regions of North Carolina and East Tennessee and had little contact with the colonists. Indians in the Southeast. In 1885, North Carolina bill changed the history of Indians in the Southeast. Anthropologist James Mooney included the Croatan Indians and other mixed race communities in the adjoining North and South Carolina counties. In his studies of the Indian tribes of the Southeast in 1907, and Frank G. Speck traveled throughout the Southeast discovering lost tribes. And then the book is The Lumbee Problem. Person County granted a group called Old Issue Negroes their own separate school. On February 2nd, 1887, it was discounted about 1896, but reestablished on January 4th, 1901. Listed as Mongolian through 1906, Cuban from April 6 to 1908 through 1901, enlisted as for the Indian race in October 1912. All right. um, other invented North Carolina Indian tribes followed the Sampson County Kohari Indians, Columbus County Waccamasuan Indians, and Halifax County Haliwa Saponi Indians. Virginia recognized the former free persons of color community of Norfolk County as Nansamon Indians and the community in Amherst County as Monacan Indians. A study in 1920 describes the group in Halifax County. Probably the largest group of free Negroes to be found in North Carolina was the exclusive old issue settlement known far and wide as the Meadows near Ransom's Bridge on Fishing Creek in Halifax County. The group still bears the appellation Old Issue and are hurtfully detested by the well-to-do Negroes in the adjoining counties. All right, says so these arguments uh, with the former free persons of color communities were probably a major factor in creating the 20th century uh, fiction that light-skinned people who look nearly white descended from Indians. All right, y'all. So that's where we're going to end it. Um, again, that is uh, mainly the whole introductory page for the uh, Free African Americans website. So I will drop this link if anybody wants to go back and check on some things that were covered. Um, let me drop that in here real quick. So that's there. Um, but yeah, um, again, uh, for everybody in here that's listening in, um, please get over to the Mixcloud page and subscribe. It really doesn't take that long to create an account and subscribe because this is where I would like to start doing live streams. Um, you know, I'm going to maybe come over back over to YouTube one more time just to kind of catch the people who may have missed, may have missed this. Um, also, if, uh, you know, if you like building and, uh, you know, getting into some real life solution type things, we're over on Clubhouse uh, doing that. Uh, the name of the group is the Autonomous Party. Uh, there's also a website. Um, again, come over, you know, listen in, see what we're talking about. Um, you know, see if it's for you. Um, 
No, it, it, it can't hurt to listen, right? So something we need to be doing um, over on uh, Clubhouse, David, David Corey. So everybody at this point um, on your either Android or iPhone should be able to get the Clubhouse. Uh, they have it for both things. Um, you know, if anybody needs a link to get in there, because I think they're still doing it by invitation. Um, you know, just hit anybody up in the chat. They, they get you hooked up. I can get you hooked up, whatever. Um, but yeah, I appreciate y'all getting in here again. Uh, just remember, uh, you can't get anywhere till you've done your genealogy. That's always going to be the first thing. Um, that should be the most important thing to you to get that started if you haven't started. Please reach out to, you know, myself and others who are doing genealogy. Um, you know, we even we even hold, you know, classes on that because um, we feel like that's really, really important. Um, you guys know I've always banged about genealogy being important since day one. Um, let me see. If I can, uh, y'all give me a second. I'm going to stop to share, share screen for a minute. So give me just a second here. I'll cut the music. So with, uh, with Clubhouse, uh, I believe the only way to get into it is, um, I don't know if you can do multiple, uh, streams and, uh, you know, multiple invitations. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that would work, but yes, yeah, clubhouse, um, give me a second here. I know we're going to have, you know, a lot of people that want to get over there. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to drop the link to it. Um, again, I believe you can only get in there by invitation and somebody can, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that so there's the link where you can just kind of look it up and download it onto your phone um, but email me I'll put my email in here if anyone's interested in whatever I have available I can you know um, I can give you give me one second here y'all Here we go. So, <clears throat> so that's the link to, uh, to, or that's my email, um, to get in contact with me. But, uh, you know, we, we, at some point, you know, I just, I've just gotten to the point with myself is, is I need to start getting some solutions going with, you know, getting things done. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've done all the talking. I feel like I can as far as uh, Indian information is, is concerned. Um, we got a lot of new, uh, young, up and coming people who are covering that. So I don't feel like I really need to do that as much anymore. So appreciate all the young people, you know, diving into this. Um, you guys are the inspiration for me to keep, you know, to keep hope alive with this. Um, you know, again, I love all y'all for, uh, supporting me over the years and uh you know we're gonna keep this thing going um remember it's always about the next seven generations so just keep that in mind um you know we got to get something in place for them all right y'all so i am out of here um love each and every one of y'all and uh i'll catch y'all again peace kind of hop nappy relatives and me wa Pahushka Obi me ha Obi me ha Obi me ha Obi me ha This is a dangerous group Is it groups that we're dealing with now? Not to hijack it yet
trying to hop happy relatives. They had no idea their ancestors had been free. I'll leave me here. 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 They had no idea their ancestors had been free. I'll leave me here. I'll leave me here. I'll leave me here. I'll leave me here. That's